else, and I'm sure you are by now. I invite you to spend some time on the website at gnhre.org, where you'll find a growing research repository, community member pages containing announcements, blogs, and other items of interest to our members, a video library of some of our recent events, including last year's global series on human rights strategies and climate change litigation, and soon we'll be posting the videos of this summer winter school for the, for the classes that you might have missed. And if you're not already a member, I invite you to join through the website. It is a true honor today to welcome you to the final session of the 2021 Summer Winter School, jointly sponsored by the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment and the UN Environment or UNEP, and organized by Dina Lupin Townsend, Deputy Director of the GNHRE and Angela Karayuki of UNEP, also a member of the GNHRE core team. Please note that this session is being recorded, so you're welcome to turn off your cameras. Today's program considers how the field of business and human rights impacts the prevention and remedy of environmental human rights harms. We'll begin with an introduction to the three pillars of the 2011 UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, the state duty to protect, the business responsibility to respect, and access to remedy. Other related international responsible business conduct standards that clarify the responsibility of businesses to respect and support environmental human rights, including human rights defenders, will then be introduced along with developments in due diligence law. The class will conclude by reflecting on the challenges and promises of access to remedy in light of recent transnational environmental corporate accountability cases the lack of ratifications of existing environmental liability conventions and the BHR treaty process. It is a true pleasure now to introduce you to Professor Sarah Sack, an invaluable member of the GNHRE core team and its director for North America. Sarah is an associate professor with the Schulich School of Law um, and is an associate professor with the Schulich, sorry, with his, Shula School of Law and Marine Environmental Law Institute at Dalhousie University in Canada. She teaches and researches at the intersection of international human rights and environmental law with particular attention to the business and human rights dimensions. She is also a member of the Teaching Business and Human Rights Forum and a member of the editorial board of the Business and Human Rights Journal. Surya Deva will serve as the discussant today Surya is an associate professor of the School of Law at the City University of Hong Kong and the current vice chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. His primary research interests lie in business and human rights, India, China, constitutional law and sustainable development. He is one of the founding editors in chief of the Business and Human Rights Journal and he sits on the editorial or advisory board of several human rights law journals around the world. This session is intended to be very interactive, so please make your comments and questions in the chat box. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Sarah Sek. Thank you very much, Erin, for the introduction. Um, thank you, Surya, for joining in as a, our commentator discussant for, for this session. And um, thank you so much to the organizers as well, to um, Dina and Angela. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen, which hopefully is working well. Yep, you can go great. Okay. Oops. So, just building for a brief moment on Aaron's introduction, I have a, a slide here just that allows me to reflect for a moment on who I am as I'm teaching this course. Um, as Erin has said, I am a member of the Schulich School of Law, part of the Marine Environmental Law Institute. I'm physically located in Halifax, Nova Scotia, but of course all of Canada has a very long history, a very long colonial history and very troubled historic relations with indigenous peoples. And so it's important for me to also acknowledge that where I am is located in Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And that acknowledgement is part of a theme that I just want to sort of note as, as something that runs through how I think about business and human rights and how I think about the relationship with environment. 
which is the importance of acknowledging and thinking about the relationships that underlie um, all of the legal frameworks that, that we use. They are all founded on relationship and relationship with people, but also um, with nature, with physical locations. Um, Surya also has some reflections to offer. Thank you, Arin, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, and thank you, uh, everyone who made this possible. Uh, I'm delighted to be joining. So very briefly, uh, uh, I would like to mention the context which triggered uh, my interest in business and human rights. And this goes back to year 2000 when I started teaching in the city in India called Bhopal. And the two pictures that you see, these are the pictures that I took uh, several years back when I visited Bhopal again. And uh, they reflect of the current state in terms of the Bhopal gas disaster. Of course, that took place in 1984, uh, but the site of the plant is still there. And of course, people are still struggling. So I think this is a nice contrast from a very beautiful picture that uh, Sarah presented. And I think that shows the contrast uh, in, in terms of the landscape of business and human rights or the climate change or the environmental issues. And of course, uh, my last point for now is that uh, I come from India and I'm based in Hong Kong. And that means that we're talking about two giants, India and China. And I think both are absolutely vital, both to business and human rights, as well as to climate change. What progress we make or do not make is going to be quite linked to how these two countries uh, lead or do not lead. So back to you, Sarah, with that. Thank you, Surya. So here's an outline of what we are hoping to accomplish in the next little bit. Um, we have divided our uh, discussions into three parts. Um, I will be doing a bit of a mini lecture for each of the three parts. And for part three, Surya will uh, provide his own uh, mini lecture with regard to the draft uh, BHR treaty. But after each section, um, uh, Surya will first reflect and comment on, on what I have presented, and then we have uh, built-in space for discussion. Um, I encourage you again to post comments and questions in the chat along the way, so we will pick those up um, after each uh, session. But I also have, um, we've also developed a couple of questions for you to reflect on as well at the end of each session. So with that, um, part one introduction to business and human rights. So what is business and human rights? And, and I'll, I'll note that I've designed this with the understanding that some of the participants are well-versed in business and human rights, but not in environmental human rights. And others are well-versed in the environment and human rights intersection, but not well-versed in business and human rights. And so um, this is the aim first then is to provide a basic introduction to the idea of business and human rights. It is something that is generally associated with international human rights law. Um, the 2011 guiding principles on business and human rights were endorsed by the um, UN Human Rights Council and many other actors in 2011. They're often described as a polycentric governance uh, framework consisting of three pillars. The first, the state duty to, to protect, the second, the business responsibility to respect, and the third, access to remedy. Now, I note that it's important to understand business and human rights as very much a multidisciplinary um, area. While I frame this as being about international human rights law, there's a really important uh, engagement from within the business community, within business schools, whether this is thought of as an ethics, business ethics or strategy question, their international relations dimensions, public policy, all kinds of other different ways of sort of intersecting with this, with this area. Um, and that is important. Within law, as somebody who teaches environmental law, I often reflect on how do we bring business and human rights into the environmental law classroom? And in what other ways can it be brought into the, the teaching community within law schools? Um, which is something we can reflect on further. So first, what is a business? Business and human rights is premised on this idea that we all know what a business is. Um, and it does come out in the international law context from this history of 
um, transnational corporations first, of course, um, engaged in the colonial enterprise, an important uh, historical piece to acknowledge. Um, and then secondly, from work at the United Nations um, in the 1970s on um, 1970s and further on the importance of um, acknowledging the power of transnational corporations and figuring out how to um, ensure accountability at the same time. Um, but business and human rights isn't necessarily only about transnational corporations. And I think that's the, the key point that I want to make um, here. So when one is thinking about an environmental issue that has a business dimension, it's really important to think about what kind of business um, are you talking about? Is it a state-owned enterprise? Is it a family-owned company, which is actually a, a private company that could be quite large? Um, in fact, in, in the context where I live, there, there are some extremely large family-owned uh, businesses. On the other hand, it could be a publicly owned one in which there are investors, which, which allows for different ways of engaging with and, and um, promoting change. On the other hand, maybe you're not actually talking about a, a corporation at all. Maybe it's a business that is um, actually a partnership or Perhaps there's, you know, it's a sole proprietorship or a business with a different, a different mission, a social enterprise. And then we might want to think about what's the difference between businesses and other kinds of organizations, such as conservation groups or universities. So when we talk about business and human rights, the focus is on business or profit business, the idea that um, we're thinking about uh, transnational corporations, multinational enterprises seems to be sort of predominant in the way that um, people engage with this, but it isn't necessarily um, the case, right? So we need to think, reflect on that as we think about business and human rights and as we think about environmental problems with the business dimension. And the final note here is um, we also often think about businesses, transnational corporations as these sort of monolithic things that exist out there but there are actually a lot of people within the company, right? There are people within headquarters, there are people who are workers, there are people who, um, are, you know, who are investors. Um, and so that's another piece of the business and human rights uh, problem or question is how to sort of engage with and motivate those within the company as well. Oops. Oops, okay. With that said, let me give the basic introduction then to the guiding principles on business and human rights. So as I've said, these date from, from 2011, there was a very large, um, extensive multi-stakeholder consultations that led into their development. They have three pillars, the state duty to protect, which is really at the core of international human rights law and reflects existing obligations, but clarifies them. The corporate responsibility to respect is where I'm going to focus my um, comments over the next uh, few minutes. This is um, a bit of a mystery. The question sort of moving into the um, endorsement of the UN guiding principles was a debate over whether um, transnational corporations have direct obligations under international human rights law, and if so, for, for which things. Um, and so there's a long history which says, yes, they do for certain areas, piracy and slavery and others being, being at, at the core. But the corporate responsibility to respect here is a bit of a different beast. And that's what we'll, we'll talk about. It's described as being a reflection of what society expects. And it requires companies to have a policy to engage in human rights due diligence and to pay attention to and, and support remedy. Um, but it's not framed as a direct obligation under international human rights law in the same way as the state duty to protect is. And as I've noted, access to remedy is the third um, pillar. The guiding principles talk about both judicial and non-judicial remedy and also point to the role of both state-based and non-state-based um, mechanisms for achieving remedy. And the final point here is just to note that the UN guiding principles have been embedded or otherwise endorsed in many other instruments. Um, and so there, this is something Surya can speak to perhaps even more extensively is 
um, it isn't just this instrument, but the extent to which they have also influenced um, other um, tools. Okay, our deep dive into the corporate responsibility to respect. This, as I've said, is the second pillar. It's a bit of a mystery in terms of how we understand it from a legal perspective, but that's something we'll unpack in the next little bit. It says specifically that business enterprises should respect human rights. This means they should avoid infringing on the human rights of others and should address adverse human rights impacts with which they are involved. And it's described as a global standard of expected conduct. There is in a subsequent principle, a discussion of which human rights, and while there's nothing there that explicitly refers to a right to a healthy environment, for example, um, it does refer to the standard um, international human rights instruments, many of which contain human rights that are obviously relevant to the environmental human rights conversation. So we can get into that, that later. Um, the commentary to principle 11 though provides the stuff that's really useful and important, I think for understanding what this um, responsibility uh, is. First, and this is the crucially important part, is that it's understood to exist independently of the state's ability or willingness to fulfill its own obligations. So the starting point for a true engagement with the responsibility to respect is an, is an expectation that states will not always, and we wish they would, but they will not always in, be in compliance with their own obligations. And so where the state is not in compliance with its own obligations, the business responsibility to respect would suggest that businesses nevertheless have a responsibility to respect human rights, even where the state is not in compliance. And that is, as I say, crucially important because it isn't traditionally how lawyers think about businesses, right? The, the usual is, well, the state's gonna regulate the business and if the state's not regulating the business, well, the business throws up its hands and says, well, you know, you're not regulating me, so I'm gonna do what I want. That changes, right? If businesses have an independent responsibility, which is above compliance with national laws, which requires adequate measures to prevent, mitigate, and remediate harm, this is a very different story. It also suggests, as I note in the commentary, that contributing to the enjoyment of other rights does not offset the responsibility to respect. So you can't engage in good stuff in one area while doing harm in another. Um, and crucially also, it means that businesses are not to undermine the ability of the state to meet their own human rights obligations. This is another, of course, crucially important part. So this is the idea a few other pieces that we see in other principles. The scope of the responsibility requires businesses to avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights impacts through their own activities and to address such impacts. And also to seek to prevent or mitigate adverse impacts directly linked to their operations, products or services by their business relationships, even if they have not contributed to those impacts. This again goes beyond sort of the traditional legal understandings of responsibility. It's the, as I say, the traditional legal ones that are much, much narrower, but here the idea of prevention and mitigation of impacts that are linked through relationships, going back to my earlier comment on the importance of thinking relationally, um, informs how this is, how the, under, how the responsibility is understood. Um, it's thought to apply to all enterprises, regardless of size, sector, operational context, ownership, and structure. And again, nevertheless, the scale and complexity means that the responsibility may vary according to these factors, as well as the severity of the adverse impacts. Um, and so here we can think again that this is not just a responsibility for the largest enterprises, although obviously being more powerful and larger means that the responsibility is greater. And then finally, how to make this responsibility operational. 
This is elaborated in principles 16 to 24. As I noted earlier, there's a requirement of a policy commitment that companies engage in something known as human rights due diligence, which goes beyond the material risk to the company to include risks to rights holders. This is again, a, quite a different um, conception. And then finally, remedy is, is important. The overall context presented in principle 23 is that all business enterprises should comply with all laws. And this is additional respect international human rights law. So even if there isn't a law, the responsibility to respect still exists. Seek ways to honor international human rights law in the event of a conflict and treat risk as a legal compliance issue, even if it's not clear that it is, because the law hasn't actually hit the point where it's clear that your lawyer is gonna tell you, you have a legal compliance issue. Nevertheless, there is this responsibility to respect human rights. So this is from a legal perspective, a little bit of an odd conversation, right? Because it's going beyond what the law says. Um, and yet, as we'll talk about um, in a little bit, my claim would be that this has, is nevertheless, should be understood, let's put it this way, as legally relevant, even if it isn't explicitly law. Now, Surya may have quite a different set of ideas to share on this first part of the presentation. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Surya first. Um, and then I have a few questions and I also see that there may be some questions in the chat so we can go from there. But first, over to you, Surya. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this uh, very quick and precise uh, introduction. As uh, uh, And I think as you highlighted, it is always a challenge to teach business and human rights in such a short time and when we don't know the profile fully of the participants, but, but we are doing our best. So I'll make some quick uh, comments uh, in response to what Sarah mentioned, or perhaps she did not mention. And then uh, we will uh, kind of invite uh, reflections from the participants. Uh, my starting point would be that uh, though Sarah focused mostly on UN guiding principles, uh, we should not get the impression uh, out of this today's webinar that business and human rights equals to UN guiding principles. No. Business and human rights as a field, as an area, is much broader than UN guiding principles. Of course, that is a dominant uh, authoritative standards in, in this particular field, and, and the a significant amount of literature and scholarship revolves around UNGPs. Uh, but I think they are not the same thing. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, the uptake of the UN guiding principles has been unprecedented. I'm not aware of any other UN document which in the span of 10 years has been uh, adopted by the states, civil society, businesses, industry associations, sports associations and bodies, and by, 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 by almost everyone across the board all over the world which is unprecedented. But I would like to add a footnote that this unprecedented uptake is on paper is different from practice. So governments, companies are saying, oh, we follow UNGPs, we are committed, this is our national action plan, or, or we are developing a national action plan, that is a paper. So the uptake on paper is highly impressive but I will not say that the uptake in practice is equally impressive. And I think that creates this uh, wide gap between whether they're really walking the talk in terms of that. Uh, I think these are the words, right? Business and human rights. And the word rights appear there. What does it really mean to say that rights are really rights in the business and human rights field. And Sarah may have a different perspective, but in my view, rights in BHR do not really mean rights in the sense of being legally binding and foreseeable and accountability yet. There is an aspiration to go there, I would say, but as of now, they don't really mean rights. And in fact, I have uh, started articulating this that we need to bring the rights 
and right shoulder central to BHR if we have to make the progress in future. Otherwise, we will just be making some superficial changes uh, to this particular uh, point. I have several other points as well, but probably uh, I'll keep it, uh, I will stop here, Sarah, and let us see if the participants have some questions or reflections for us. Uh, otherwise, I could come back and, and start talking again. <laughs> Does it sound good? There is one. Over to you. A question in the chat that I that I would like to pose to you, which is to ask you both to reflect on how these principles apply to INGOs. I think that's a great question, and I'm I'm going to see if Surya has any reflections as well. This is certainly it's something that I have wondered about: is whether there is whether we should contemplate how these do apply to INGOs. I don't think this has been typically the conversation that has taken place, but it seems to me that any organization that is a large organization using a type of corporate structure, um, whether it is engaged in not-for-profit activities or for profit should nevertheless be understood as having uh, similar, if not the same responsibilities. And I will note actually that, whoops. Well, no, here we go. In fact, <laughs> this is one of the questions that I had put on my slide as questions to, con to consider. Um, do we think that the business responsibility to respect human rights should also apply to other non-state, non-business organizations? And I put up universities because this is something I wonder about a lot because universities seem to increasingly be operating like private businesses and they might not be have the same power as certain organizations, but then again, uh, maybe they do. Um, and so I think international organizations, ENGOs, um, as far as I can see, I think the argument could be made that they do apply, but I'm not sure if anybody has actually made that claim. Suri, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I think uh, technically speaking or strictly speaking, I think they don't apply. Uh, they only apply to business enterprises and perhaps it, the intention was not to apply them to civil society and other institutions. That, that's my view, okay? Uh, but the practice, again, is very different. The practice is that uh, they have been uh, increasingly applied uh, by non-business entities. FIFA is a good example. FIFA is incorporated in Switzerland as a non-profit entity. Uh, and FIFA has taken on board UN guiding principles. Uh, International Olympic Association has taken on board uh, these guiding principles. Uh, some of you may recall that WWF was in fact, uh, a, a complaint was filed against WWF for breach of OECD guidelines. So WWF is not a typical business enterprise, right? So I think the practice is different, though I think the, uh, the um, technical or the literal uh, interpretation would be that they don't apply to anyone else who is not a business enterprise. My last point for now is that uh, we should see uh, UN guiding principles in the larger context in which everyone has a human rights responsibility. All of us as well as an individual. And I think all the institutions that we have in society they have human rights responsibility. So that would be uh, the typical horizontal application of human rights in my view. And uh, of course, UNGPs frame it as a social expectation, but in my view, uh, it is more than a social expectation because under constitutional law, many of these human rights are legally binding even at the horizontal setting. So I'll stop at this. Aaron, I, I saw some additional questions in the chat. Uh, would you like to uh, help us with these, please? <laughs> yes, we do have some wonderful questions, very challenging questions in the chat. So let me just pose a couple of them to you um, and then we can sort of do them in, in groups. Um, uh, the first has to do with um, small businesses. 
and the um, obligations of small businesses to do due diligence and how they can be expected to do that on the same level as larger, more resourced businesses um, and sort of the, the um, different obligations that might apply there. A second question has to do with um, responsibility of businesses for past greenhouse gas emissions and thinking about um, the obligations towards climate change and also different kinds of remedial obligations that might um, ensue, including uh, ecosystem restoration, things like that. So perhaps you'd like to talk about those and then we can sort of go on to the many additional questions. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll make a couple of uh, quick comments on this. So, and this maybe links back to the, the earlier conversation also about uh, which businesses um, and, and how to think about that. So I think it's absolutely true and the guiding principles recognize that um, what a business is gonna be able to do is gonna differ depending on their size. Um, and so this is of course gonna be an important consideration. The capacity aspect is also really important. So it's interesting to note, for example, that the UN Global Compact, um, which has been around since 2000, has a very active, um, it, it is re really operates as sort of a learning network. And there, there are other initiatives as well that are really out there designed to um, help draw attention to these kind of guidelines and to pro provide education on best practices so that businesses can learn what it would mean to, to engage responsibly. Um, and that is, it isn't something that instantly happens. There does have to be sort of a learning aspect to it. Um, the other, the other uh, point that I'll make on that is, and this goes to the organizational question earlier, is there are other initiatives like, for example, the International Standardization Organization, which also has guidances, one on, but, but it is for organizations, not just for businesses. And it, it does also have a social responsibility um, tool that, that organizations can use. Um, on the, on the um, climate uh, question, which I think is hugely important, I absolutely think that thinking through a business and human rights lens leads to the question of how does, how, uh, you know, shouldn't we be thinking about remedy as opposed to simply reducing um, emissions when it comes to um, fossil fuel companies. And, and I think that this tool is something that can lead us in that direction. They're, they're practical questions. And, and I'll note that climate change is something we're going to get to a little bit later. So maybe I'll hold off on saying more um, at that point. Uh, yeah, thanks. There's a couple of other questions in the, in the chat that I think sort of go to um, what other legal regimes we might think of as supporting and buttressing the um, environmental human rights goals that BHR is, is intending to accomplish. So one question from Delaware is um, whether corporate laws, particularly let's say for instance, Delaware general corporate law, um, which governs so many um, global corporations or corporations globally, um, whether corporate law or also whether regional human rights instruments like the African Charter of Human People, People and Human Rights um, could also provide um, ways in or ways of supporting the law. I, I would say again, absolutely. <clears throat> and we could have an entire session on how to think about corporate laws and their engagement with environment. There, there are all kinds of interesting things um, happening and relevant to interpretation of, you know, director fiduciary duties and all the, all these kinds of things. Um, and same with the regional, the regional instruments. Um, so that's a short yes. Uh, and uh, I'm slightly conscious of the time. I'm wondering if we should now perhaps, unless Surya has a burning thought at this point that, that you want to share, that maybe we could then move into the environmental human rights piece and- I have many, but let us move. <laughs> yeah, okay. because, because we need to cover uh, quite a lot. Thank All right, you. we'll we'll keep we'll keep going. I will note that one other quest discussion question that I put up here was um, to think about whether the response whether we should understand the responsibility to respect um, as needing to go beyond this do no harm idea um, and extending instead to the idea of positive obligations. And I know Surya has a lot that could be said about this. And this includes thinking about the role of businesses in supporting human rights defenders, for example, rather than 
simply not, not harming them. Um, okay, so let me move through the next sort of uh, piece, which is really bringing the business and human rights conversation to, um, every now and then my slides don't move. Okay, here we go, <laughs> to uh, the environmental human rights uh, dimension. So as I've noted, what I think about sometimes is how do I introduce business and human rights into a class on environmental law? And so what I'm sharing with you here is how I think about doing this and, and try to do this in, in practice. Um, first of all, in, in my environmental law class, I would of course talk about international environmental law and its relationship to domestic law. And so it then becomes easy to talk about international human rights law, a basic introduction to what it is, and to think about its relationship with um, environmental law. The easiest and wonderful way to do this now is because we have had uh, special rapporteurs on human rights and the environment, and of course a long history of, of rapporteurs in relation to toxic wastes and water and other things. Um, from John Knox's work, we have the wonderful mapping reports that, that document the relationship between human rights and the environment in many different sources of international human rights law, including regional, um, regional treaty contexts, as well as international environmental law, all pulled together into the 2018 framework principles on human rights and the environment, which talk extensively about human rights and environment through a procedural rights lens, a substantive rights lens, and with attention to the underlying importance of non-discrimination and vulnerability. Um, and so the, I, have a, I have three slides that just put up all of the framework principles, and you'll notice that only two of them have bolded text, and then I have a couple of subsequent slides. What's wonderful about the framework principles when I teach environmental law is that you can lay these out as being a, a really good way to sort of evaluate the legal system um, that, that you're in. Like, do we actually fully protect all of these aspects of rights um, within Canadian environmental law? Um, and the framework principles are very much framed with attention to state obligations. So you see in each, it's states should do this, that, and the other. They very nicely lay out the importance of um, a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, but also note its relationship with other human rights. And so if you're in a country that doesn't actually um, recognize the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, nevertheless, other human rights are all um, implicated. And then in, in, in number two, the importance really of the procedural environmental rights, the procedural hum, environmental human rights dimension in order to actually ensure the protection of a safe, clean, healthy, sustainable environment. And principle three, again, turning to this importance of recognizing um, the, the problem of um, discrimination and the problem of a lack of equal and effective protection. The next set of here are these principles four to 10. These are all what I would sort of package into a fulsome understanding of procedural environmental rights. And I think these principles do a great job. But the only principle here that makes any reference to business is principle eight. So there's a lot of great stuff here, but we don't, we're missing the fulsome business engagement. Now, um, the special rapporteur at the time noted that there was a need for further development of business responsibilities in relation to environmental rights. So he was quite conscious of that. Similarly, when we look at principles 11 to 16, here we're talking more about substantive environmental rights, um, effective enforcement, duties to cooperate with others for transboundary and global harms, um, and then several principles that again highlight the importance of um, paying attention to and being aware of vulnerability and vulnerability, of course, may arise, may be innate, but it may arise as a result of violations of other rights. Um, and so that's also an important framing in here. In principle 15, the importance of the rights of indigenous peoples, including rights to self-determination as, as a, again, a critical part of a fulsome um, approach to environmental human rights. So what do the framework principles actually say about the business responsibility? We have two little insights here. We have in principle 12, paragraph 35, 
reference explicitly to the guiding principles on business and human rights. The responsibility of business enterprises includes to avoid causing and contributing to adverse human rights impacts through environmental harm to address. And you see language here again that, that is directly from the business responsibility pillar that I was talking about. The added pieces that I've put in red are the ones that sort of draw attention to the environmental dimensions. So businesses should comply with all applicable environmental laws, but also issue clear policy commitments to meet their responsibility to respect human rights through environmental protection. Um, and so you, you go on, they should identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they address their environmental impacts on human rights and enable the remediation of any adverse environmental human rights impacts they cause or to which they contribute. And then similarly, principle eight, this is the only other principle in the framework principles that explicitly talks about business responsibilities. We see here in a principle that's focused on the importance of states um, requiring environmental impact assessment um, discussion of business enterprises conducting human rights impact assessment in accordance with the guiding principles. So they should identify and assess any actual or potential adverse human rights impacts and so on, and engage in meaningful consultations with potentially affected groups or other relevant stakeholders. And of course that needs to be read in light of principles 14 and importantly 15, which draws attention again to the rights of indigenous peoples and free prior and informed consent as, as an aspect. Now, to go backwards for a second, um, <laughs> my question, and I think the thing that's really important is um, there should be a business dimension to each of these framework principles. And so we need to think about what that would look like. This would be the claim. So. Principle four, which is about, again, the protection of enabling a safe space for environmental human rights defenders. This should very clearly be something that businesses also play a role in. Same with respect and protecting rights of others to freedom of expression, association and peaceful assembly, and so on. Um, it can, could be, perhaps, that the business role should be different from the state role. But I think the question is, what exactly should the business responsibility be and how can we build up practice and understanding and clarification of what that business role might be. So the last um, couple of points before we have again some more discussion then is to note that since the guiding principles and since the framework principles there have of course been many many reports from other special rapporteurs some of which engage extensively with um, the, the business responsibility, uh, some of which ignore it completely and some of which touch on it a little bit. Um, there are also clarifications coming from the OHCHR and also UNEP um, on business and human rights and the environment. And so we see, for example, um, one on biodiversity and one on hazardous substances. In the key messages on biodiversity of which there are 13, there, are, there is one reference to the business responsibility. Um, and again, if you read through it, which is I'm not gonna do right now, you'll note that again, it reflects very much what how this is framed under the guiding principles um, with the added reference, avoid infringing on the human rights of others, including by causing biodiversity loss and so on. Um, similarly, in the key messages on hazardous substances, we have a little bit more, two principles that actually refer to the business responsibility itself. Um, and again, provide some clarifications here. And I think in the hazardous substances context, there is there has been further development and engagement with what the business responsibility might mean. So there are, there are other, other reports. And we also see usefully linkages between other principles like the polluter pays principle here um, and um, the business responsibility and, and, and so on. Also references to information, although here it should refrain from supporting public information campaigns based on inaccurate, misleading and unfounded assertions. Um, 
And I think that's obviously important, but I kind of wonder if maybe businesses really should and do have an obligation to do more when it comes to providing actually um, and sharing uh, accurate information. So one can, one can discuss that, that further. Um, the last slide, this is where I'm gonna go over to Surya, uh, is to note that there is um, also from the OHCHR more recently, a very specific focused on business, human rights, climate change, and business set of key messages. Um, and the key messages, of course, do talk about the state duty, but they do much more extensively than the others engage with the business responsibility. Um, and it includes, towards the end, advocating a rights-based approach to business activities related to climate change. Um, and so with that, over to Surya to add some reflections on what I've just said. Thank you, Sarah, once again. Uh, that is excellent. Uh, so let me quickly make some additional points. Uh, I will start by saying that, uh, of course, there are uh, very critical and important connections between human rights on the one hand and the environment and climate change on the other hand. I will also suggest that we should keep them separate as well. So they are interrelated, but separate as well, because uh, we should not end up having a situation in which climate issues and environmental issues are totally subsumed within human rights. They don't have their independent existence. Uh, I think it is critical to keep them separate, both from a normative perspective and also from practical perspective. At the same time, recognizing that there are interlinkages and there are connections, and that's why we should see them in a more holistic sense. My second point is that, uh, as Sarah has highlighted uh, repeatedly, that uh, one key contribution of UN guiding principles is uh, that pillar two is an independent responsibility, which is a very powerful message. But I think we should also be alive to the reality. And I think there are some questions reflecting on that. And the reality is this, that when businesses are trying to respect human rights, states may not allow them to do respect human rights. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that if pillar one fails, the state has a policy to abuse human rights, or a state does not provide this environment or uh, free civic space where businesses can do human rights due diligence, then businesses cannot respect human rights, even if they want to. So on paper, this idea that go beyond the law may work in many situations. But I would also like you to think that it will not work in many other situations. Uh, so I think we should be, uh, again, dependent on this idea of pillar one and, and what I will call uh, recover the state and recover the political will that the state acts. And I think it is not merely the protection. Of course, pillar one is focusing on the duty to protect, but I will argue that the states have the respect, protect and fulfill duties under international human rights law. And we should not ignore that because sometimes if you just read pillar one, you may forget that there are two other pillars of a state's obligations. So pillar one is only picking up the most relevant one in relation to business, but we cannot lose sight of the respect and the fulfill elements. And because there are again dynamic relationships between those three. Uh, I think I would like to make the last point for now is that I think there was a question about uh, uh, the past uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right? Uh, can that be part of the responsibility? Now, if you look at the human rights standards, they have to be applied prospectively. We cannot say that they are retrospective because that if we apply them retrospectively, that itself will be a breach of a human right. At the same time, I will argue that uh, we can apply them prospectively, but in a dynamic way to capture the adverse impacts that took place in the past. And I think that would be, I would say the way forward. Uh, but again, probably uh, 
Sarah will talk about in the next section, the shell case where the tissue may become relevant uh, directly and the UNGPs were relied on in this particular context. Could you repeat what I said? Uh, what I said is that uh, technically speaking and from a human rights perspective, we cannot apply UNGPs or other in international human rights standards retrospectively because you should know the rules of the game before you are expected to follow them. But when they are not there, you can't expect companies to follow them, right? At the same time, uh, human rights are very dynamic and it is our role to be creative. So what I suggest is that they, even if they are prospective, we can interpret them in a dynamic manner to capture the past adverse impacts and the ongoing situations of greenhouse emissions or including human rights abuses, which could be systemic and continuing for decades. So let's stop at this. Thanks so much for that. I think that is a really interesting uh, sort of distinction that you're making there um, and a very sort of creative way to think about responsibility for ongoing um, in environmental and human rights impacts. Um, I want to pose a few of the questions that have come up in the chat. Um, I think we have a few minutes for that. And one really sort of connects in a way to that, which has to do with the responsibility of state actors and specifically of state-owned entities. But the, the examples that are given in the chat are from, say, Fukushima. So again, you have this question of something that happened in the past, but the ongoing impacts and the ongoing responsibilities towards that. Let me just mention a couple of other questions that have come up. One is sort of quite specific, but has to do with financial complicity and whether that could be a basis um, for, um, for accountability going forward. And then there's another sort of set of questions that in a way asks about, um, and, and again, you may be going to address some of these um, in, the, in the last section of the, of the session, but the question has to do with successes. And um, we are all aware, and you did remind us that there's a big gap between what's on paper and what the reality is. But nonetheless, the question is, are there successes? And then specifically sort of questions about two um, examples. I hesitate to call them examples because they're quite significant. But one is whether there's been any um, action in this context with regard to the Amazon. Um, and the other is, about state and international community responses to major cases like Shell in Nigeria. And again, I'll just sort of pose those and you can answer them either now or in the course of your comments to come. I admit, I think I've been quite bad at keeping track of all of these questions. So th thank you. So I'll start off with a few few thoughts and then pass it over to Surya and we can, we can regroup after that. Um, on the state-owned enterprises, this is a really important piece and one, one I think that is crucial to, to wrap our heads around. So uh, pillar one of the UN guiding principles talk about state-owned enterprises in, in relation to the state duty to protect. But uh, pillar two, the business responsibility also talks about state-owned enterprises. And so the key is that state-owned enterprises are very much subject to uh, pillar two. So this, the responsibility to respect does absolutely apply to state-owned enterprises. But because they're state-owned enterprises, they should be under a heightened, we should have heightened expectations of them um, that goes beyond what is expected under under pillar two. And so this is an interesting, um, I think an interesting and really crucially important uh, conversation to have, because again, even in the climate context, there's often a lot of attention that's given to the, the contributions of um, what we understand as private enterprises, even though that, that terminology is a bit challenging, right? But there are a lot of state-owned enterprises that have been huge contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And so thinking through their responsibility in that context, I think is also really, really important. Um, Surya, do you wanna pick up on that or the next question? Uh, yeah, I can quickly uh, make some comments of some of the questions if that is okay, in one go. Uh, about SOEs, I completely agree with Sarah. So I think uh, both pillar one and two will apply to them, in fact. Uh, and I think you may look at a report or the working group where we articulate that SOEs should lead by example. So, so they, they definitely have to do something more than what a normal profit-making business enterprise should do. Uh, 
In, in terms of uh, the financial complicity question, yes, uh, complicity could be definitely financial, but I think uh, we should be mindful that UNGPs in itself cannot support litigation or, or a criminal complaint simply because there is a financial complicity, right? There is a possibility you can make a complaint to the national contact point uh, using OECD guidelines. Uh, and of course, uh, technically you can uh, pursue a case even before uh, International Criminal Court, not against the company, but the company officials. If we can show a connection between the financing uh, for those crimes which are covered under the Rome statute. So I think that possibility is definitely there. Uh, in terms of Amazon, I think uh, I can't remember the case now, but I think there are several complaints before NCPs and BlackRock, for instance, is being targeted now because BlackRock has made a BlackRock uh, for the benefit of everyone. BlackRock is the largest um, uh, investment fund uh, institutional. And they have recently made a commitment to respect human rights as well. They had previously talked about uh, climate change, environmental issues and all that. And I think they are going to be under more and more pressure. So the role of institutional investors, uh, pension funds, uh, and in entities like BlackRock is going to become quite relevant. And of course, there are companies also which are operating there. And I think they have been sued uh, in Europe as well as cases uh, before the national contact points. Let me finish with the success stories. I think there are some success stories. I would say there are some companies, uh, because I'm part of the working group, I cannot name the companies, uh, but these companies are really doing well in terms of uh, mapping out their adverse impacts uh, throughout the supply chains. And uh, so that is well documented. I mean, if you Google it, you'll find it. And they have been also documented, let us say, by Dennis Institute for Human Rights or other organizations for those success stories. They are very much there. You can also look at our reports in which we highlight some of those success stories. And, and you can also argue that uh, the rise of mandatory human rights due diligence is also a success story. Because increasingly, the governments in Europe are coming forward and saying, oh, we need to make it mandatory. Pillar one, uh, voluntary alone will not be enough. So I'll stop at this for now. Thank you. If I could, before we move on, there's a couple of questions that specifically ask about sort of the environmental aspect to this. And I wonder if we could just get your thoughts about this. And again, forgive me for those of you who have written very elaborate and thoughtful questions, and I'm sort of summarizing them. Um, but the, um, our, our speaker and our discussant can see the questions also. But um, one question is about um, whether another way to come at this is by embodying environmental rights in human rights instruments, for instance, having the right to a healthy environment recognized. And then sort of along the similar lines is about the inclusion of ecocide as an international crime before the International Criminal Court. Um, and whether that could have implications for business and human rights. I'll, I'll start um, then responding to these. I mean, these are, these are great questions and I, and I think there's, this is all hugely important. The, um, the right to a healthy environment and recognition of it, I think is crucially important, but I also think it's crucially important to, to um, to be aware that one can make strides even in jurisdictions where that right has not been completely, has not been officially recognized. Um, and similarly, one can make strides even if there isn't official recognition um, at the UN General Assembly level, for example, which isn't to say we shouldn't be pushing for it. I like to think about the right to a healthy environment in a similar way to indigenous rights, perhaps. Um, and, and I think, a key point is recognition, right? So what we're seeking at the international level is recognition of something that already exists. Um, so it exists whether or not there is official recognition by governments. It exists because it is something that must exist and because people claim it. Um, and so it would be nice if it was recognized officially, but even if it's not recognized officially, it nevertheless exists. And so we, the, the challenge is to argue in cases where it hasn't been officially recognized, 
how it nevertheless must be part of what the officially recognized instruments already um, have. So that, that's my just sort of thinking on that. On the eco side point, I think this is really helpful in, for, for a number of, of reasons. And this isn't something I think that we have, uh, <laughs> that we built time in for, for the conversation today. But for example, if you think about the Nevson litigation um, in the Canadian context, which is about forced labor and, and, and other issues that are not environmental issues, the, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized um, that uh, it is viable for claims to be brought for violations of customary international law by businesses. Um, and that this is, this could be, this is a viable cause of action. It's gonna depend on the facts and exactly what is claimed. And, and then the question becomes for which customary international law norms? How do we understand those? Which merit sort of this, this kind of use Kogan's uh, treatment? And I think the, the eco side work is, is hugely important, not just for what it could mean within the international criminal law system itself, but for what its implications could be for other claims using sort of tort, perhaps relying or related to customary international law. And again, relating to business and human rights, which is something we'll, we'll touch on a bit in our next, in our next session. Um, Surya, did you have any any reflections? Uh, not on this, but I could uh, quickly jump on to other parts of the questions. Uh, someone asked uh, that whether financial complicity could be uh, could, could be used uh, in the due diligence law. The answer is yes, uh, that is definitely possible. Uh, but it will also depend upon how these laws are framed. And there's a question, uh, I think by Brian, about uh, what are we, uh, which countries are implementing the UN guiding principles? I think that's what you mean by the uh, guidelines. Uh, we have so far 25 countries that have adopted a national action plan. Most of these countries are in the global north, most, mostly in fact in Europe. Uh, and uh, though these national action plans are not uh, perfect, and the implementation is weak, uh, that definitely is a step in the right direction. So there is definitely a growing momentum on the part of states in all continents, but I would say mostly in Europe to take the UN guiding principles more seriously. So I'm more uh, optimistic going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Surya. Um, and Aaron, in, in the interest of time, perhaps we'll move through the next session and then we can have um, some more fulsome discussion. So uh, before we do that, I just wanted to note that I had actually developed also a couple of discussion questions, which I just wanna share so people can think about them. Um, my sense has been that we will get greater traction um, and engagement by business, but also um, ability to engage um, and make useful interventions as we have greater clarification of what the actual responsibilities of businesses are in relation to environmental human rights problems. And so, as I noted in the, in the presentation that I did, we are starting to see that in different places at, um, for example, through the Human Rights Council work of UNEP, there are other areas as well. Um, I have and am, actively right now working with UNEP and, and the OECD and, and others to try to clarify um, the responsibilities of, of or what how responsible business conduct tools could help in responsible climate action by businesses. Um, so that's my disclosure of what, you know, I'm somebody who believes that this is possible, greater clar clarity might actually be really useful. But um, I'm also curious and wonder if there might be disadvantages to these kind of clarifications. And I'm not aware of any, so maybe I'm going to just sort of hold that there as something we can get back to later. But I did think it was an important um, question to raise. Okay, so as our time runs short, whoops, let me move on to the influence of business and human rights, corporate accountability, and treaties. And we've already had some conversation about this. Um, but let me just start. This is, I'm going to very quickly go through um, and just note sort of six slides which have a lot of text on them. But these are all from the case um, against Royal Dutch Shell that was recently heard in the Dutch uh, court, which came out with this conclusion that yes, indeed, Royal Dutch Shell does have a, a responsibility to reduce its emissions, that what it had been proposing was not enough. 
and that its responsibility extends not just to its operations and subsidiaries, but also to what in, in the climate lingo is, is extends to scope three emissions. Translating that back into the business and human rights framing, we can see this as emissions that are arising through its uh, relationships with others. And this includes here um, sale of, you know, the use of the products that, that it sells. Um, now, it didn't get there purely by relying on the guiding principles on business and human rights. Obviously, there's a lot of other stuff that went into this decision. But for somebody who believes that there is legal relevance to the business responsibility in and of itself, if then <laughs> integrated with other, uh, other existing legal aspects, I found this um, decision to be, to, to, to be very, what shall I say, um, gave, gave me hope because I've been, this is this, how, how this court engages with the guiding principles is how I understand courts should engage with the guiding principles. Um, and so first you note that um, what they're doing is using them in relation to, in, in the Dutch case, what is their unwritten standard of care? So I don't know anything about Dutch law. I don't really know what that means, but I assume it means something like what we see in you know, tort law in Canada. Um, the, the recognition that they constitute the UN guiding principles and authoritative and internationally endorsed soft law instrument, I think is important, um, that they don't establish legally binding obligations, but nevertheless are in line with other soft law instruments. This includes, I've noted the global compact, Surya was just talking about the national contact points of the OECD guidelines, which I'll say something about in a minute. Um, another important piece of this is they note that the European Commission has been expecting European businesses to meet this responsibility to respect as formulated by the UN guiding principles. You can say this about many countries. In fact, you can say this about every OECD country because, and, and the 50 countries that adhere to the OECD guidelines because the responsibility to respect is in the OECD guidelines now, and those countries are obligated to promote the OECD guidelines to companies that are, that are based within them. So the idea that governments have been promoting and establishing and, and recognizing this expectation of businesses, I think is, is accurate. Um, therefore, they conclude it's suitable to as a guideline in the interpretation of the unwritten standard of care. And then this, I think, is also a crucially important point, which distinguishes it from some of the other litigation that we've been seeing in the transnational um, environmental cases. Uh, the claim that due to the universally endorsed content of the UN guiding principles, it's irrelevant whether or not RDS itself had committed to the UN guiding principles, although as it turns out they had. But if they hadn't, it would still be seen as relevant. And that I think is really important. Now, as I said, I can't go into detail on the next sort of five slides, but I just note that um, what we see, the text that the court uses should look familiar because it reflects very much what I presented earlier in terms of the commentary to the guiding principles and um, a global standard of expected conduct exists independently of states' ability and willingness, da, 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 da. Um, here the link is made um, to human rights instruments, not specifically um, a right to a healthy environment, but human rights enshrined in the ICCPR and others, including in the ECHR, as well as, and this I made the point earlier, the in 2011, the OECD guidelines were revised to add a human rights chapter. The human rights chapter is modeled on the business responsibility to respect, but <clears throat> the OECD guidelines have lots of other chapters too. And one of them is an environment chapter. So here you see the court doing what I think is a really interesting and important move of linking the UN guiding principles with the environment chapter in the OECD guidelines and drawing in particular on, we see underneath something that's very familiar to environmental lawyers, the idea of the precautionary principle. Now the OECD guidelines environment chapter has lots of other great stuff in there that could potentially be brought together with the um, UN guiding principles. 
And so this gives great potential for legal arguments that draw together human rights and environment in a potentially useful way. Um, we see again, responsibility depends on size, et cetera, et cetera. In the case of RDS, it's a major player. It does policy setting for the Shell Group, which is a major player in the worldwide market. It's responsible for significant emissions and so on. And so that becomes an important piece. Um, here we see, again, this extensive idea. The responsibility to respect is not just about the parent and its subsidiary, but it's also about responsibility for relationships. And so here we see this, this brought in that business relationships matter. It requires companies to avoid causing and contributing through their own activities, but also to prevent or mitigate those directly linked to operations, products, or services. Now, what ultimately is required is different depending on if it's cause or contribute or these more ex extended relationships. But nevertheless, the responsibility encompasses the company's entire value chain. Value chain means, and here's how the court treats this, the activities that convert input into output by adding value. It includes entities with which it has a direct or indirect business relationship and which either supply products or services or receive products and services. And then finally, um, suggests what appropriate action might be. And so again, I'm not gonna get into this, but at the end, note RDS's responsibility defined by the influence and control it can exercise over the scope one to scope three emissions of the Shell Group and so on. So um, I think that case simply illustrates that there's great potential in thinking about the relationship of the business responsibility with other international instruments like the Paris Agreement and, and, and everything else that goes into that particular decision. Um, and that we might also want to think about its relationship with other international corporate social responsibility or responsible business conduct, which is the OECD term um, tools, and perhaps in particular, the environment chapter. Um, I suggest that there's a lot going on at the OECD in terms of uh, different sector specific standards and guidance on due diligence, and that these are often used to inform um, some of the European developments in terms of mandatory human rights due diligence legislation and, and also the work at the EU. And there are these non judicial grievance processes called national contact points. There are huge critiques of many of these, um, including the Canadian one, which is really very weak and not well used. Um, but the potential to raise complaints and to, and I think that the point would be, these are not going to result in hard remedy, but they are through complaints and conversations about what the expectations of responsible business conduct are or should be, they do serve a role in clarifying what we expect of businesses, which then again, I would claim has legal consequence or can have legal consequence or will have legal consequence um, if claims are framed with reference to these, these developments. Um, there's a ton that can be said, and we're out very close to, we're at the 9.15, sorry, 9.15 where I am, time. Um, so I'm not really gonna say anything here, except I wanna turn it over to Surya to make sure he has time to talk about the Business and Human Rights Treaty. Um, I will just note that uh, one of the suggested readings that I provided was um, one I had written a while ago in thinking about the draft BHR Treaty, um, and thinking in particular about what international environmental law and, and um, transnational environmental access to justice experiences might, might teach us or, or have us think about what we might want in a treaty. Um, many business and human rights cases um, have an environmental dimension. This is absolutely clear. Um, but of course, international environmental law treaties and others have been trying to address various, um, you know, many of the same issues through different angles for, for quite a while. Um, and not always 
uh, successfully in that sometimes we do have treaties negotiated that don't come into force and, and the liability dimension of um, international environmental law has always been um, particularly challenging. Uh, so with that, I will turn to Surya and Surya, I will uh, move your slides ahead. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I will very quickly talk about uh, this BHR treaty process that has been going on for the last six, seven years in the Human Rights Council. But before I would, uh, before I do that, let me very quickly uh, make two points about the Shell case, which uh, Sarah explained in great detail. And I think this is definitely a landmark case. So I agree on that. And I think uh, the length at which uh, the, the court has cited UNGPs is unprecedented again, uh, because there are some cases in which UNGPs have been cited, but I would say more like a passing reference. But this is like several paragraphs, and it's more or, more or less copy and paste uh, from the UN guiding principles in the judgment. So that is very extensive. And it is quite surprising that they do it, despite UNGPs not mentioning environmental rights anywhere, climate change anywhere. So I think that makes it more remarkable uh, because they, they are uh, using the human rights hook rather than the environmental rights hook or the climate change hook, uh, which is totally missing in the UNGP's text at least. Uh, the second point is that uh, though the case is unprecedented I, in my view and landmark, uh, we should be cautious what it means for the global landscape because it was in the specific Dutch context of this uh, unwritten standard of care. And in other places, the, uh, the tort law is very different. So that principle of unwritten social expectation uh, may not be applicable. But I agree with Sarah that the courts everywhere in deciding uh, tort cases should use UNGPs and other, other soft standards to interpret what is the scope of the duty of care and what what is meant by the breach of this duty and so i think uh, these are my observations now coming back to the treaty so this is the third attempt and i call it the high tide and low tide right so this is a third high tide because the first attempt was uh, in 1970s to 1990s that failed the second was the draft un norms of 2003 to 2005 that again failed and the third one is going on, which shows that there is an appetite or demand at least for binding international instrument, uh, but there is no supply in terms of the political will. So I would say there's a gap between the demand from the rights holders some developing countries, but there is no supply. And this uh, slide that you see here, you will notice that all the red are the developed countries of the global north and everyone is against. So the process, and I think that was the case in 1970s as well. Uh, but even the countries that are supporting their question marks, like uh, countries like India and China supporting, but whether they really want this binding treaty in a strong term, we don't know, because now we have multinationals coming out of India and China also, uh, which are becoming global players. So we don't really know. Um, Sarah, next please. So of course, uh, there are different views. Uh, my personal view is that we should not have uh, uh, any, uh, probably you can go to the last slide and I will come back, Sarah. So uh, what, uh, I mean, last slide of the treaty. So if you can move further here, that's it, yeah. Thank you. So my point is that uh, there could be a complementary relationship between the UN guiding principles and the future norms, including the treaty. And I just uh, wrote a paper on this. Uh, so I invite anyone who is interested to read that paper. I just put the link in the chat uh, in which I try to articulate the relationship between UN guiding principles, the duty of care, the mandatory due diligence legislation, including the treaty. So we should not think of either the treaty or the UNGPs. Rather, we should use everything that we need because all of these tools have significant limitations, right? Uh, now, if we can go back, Sarah, to the earlier slides, uh, sorry uh, to trouble you with that. Yes, so these are uh, some of the, what are the arguments that are being made uh, for or against? Uh, I, again, I don't have the time to go in detail, but uh, let me quickly go 
Uh, one argument is that uh, we already have the consensus on the UNGPs. Let us just focus on the UNGPs and implement them uh, and forget about uh, the treaty because that may take so many years and decades. And as I mentioned, even if we have a treaty, many states may not ratify it. Even if they ratify, they may not implement properly. And even, even if they implement, uh, the remedy or accountability may not be there, right? Or uh, business and human rights, they're complex issues. One treaty cannot fix everything and all this. So I think these are uh, the range of arguments that are made uh, against the treaty. Uh, again, I don't have the time to uh, present the counter arguments, but perhaps I would like to hear from you uh, if you can think of counter arguments rather than me telling you the counter arguments. If you see any value in the treaty, uh, and I will just finish with the next slide on the content, just again to flag, uh, Sarah, if you can move, thank you. If, uh, if I can just quickly mention the key issues here, uh, uh, I mean, the scope of the treaty is also a point of debate. Should it apply to all businesses or only transnational corporations? Should it cover all human rights or not? And I think there is already a reference to environmental rights. There's already a reference in the third, in the second draft uh, to something else, which is very much there. Uh, there is no reference to climate change expressly yet, uh, again, uh, but environmental rights is, is, uh, are definitely included uh, more explicitly. And of course, there is also issue about trade and investment agreements and all that. I would say, uh, one crucial component of an international agreement, uh, uh, which is binding, could be that there is a cross-border collaboration because climate change or environmental pollution, which is cross-border, the difficulty is that each of the country implementing the UNGPs will not be enough. You need a cross-border collaboration. You need a regional approach sometimes. You need a global approach sometimes, and I think for that. For that purpose itself, I think there could be some value in developing those standards at the international level. And my last point for now is that uh, going forward, we would need more ambitious norms in the field of business and human rights and climate change and environment. I'm not intentionally saying binding or voluntary. I'm not using that because we need both of them. But I'm saying more ambitious even if they are voluntary, doesn't matter. But we need, we need to uh, dismantle the, what I call the imbalances and structures of irresponsibility. I think we need to dismantle those. So I will stop at this because we just have six, seven minutes left. So Sarah, back to you. I don't know how would you like to make use of this remaining time? Thank you. I'll turn it over to Erin to see if she has any any chat uh, questions to draw to our attention. Well, um, there is one question um, that we haven't addressed yet, which has to do with whether existing regulatory instruments meet the challenges in particular of concentration of markets that we're seeing more and more, particularly in food industries and other areas like that. But I do also just want to mention in response to um, Surya's invitation, for arguments in favor of a binding treaty. Um, one comment that was made is just that states, uh, the, 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 the process of reservations exist so that states can sign on, but just exempt themselves from certain specific aspects that they don't wanna comply with. And then a second comment is just that a treaty would be more binding and also could address the gaps in the guiding principles. So I'll leave those to you. Can I jump in, Sarah, on the market question? I think that is what I meant, uh, more ambitious norms, uh, precisely to address the, those kind of issues. We have tobacco companies now claiming they are respecting UN guiding principles. To me, this is just not possible. A tobacco company cannot respect UN guiding principles, in my view. Even if they remove childcare from the supply chain, that is not respecting UN guiding principles. Uh, we have... Uh, Fundamentally, uh, and I would say it's not merely about concentration of those uh, food uh, market situations, also the, the companies which are selling sugary drinks. I mean, this is highly problematic. So these companies can keep on doing due diligence, 
And I think that is where I would say that we need to create what I call red lines. And red line means that you cannot do this activity. Whether you do due diligence or not, that is not relevant. This is not allowed. And I think that would become very critical for climate change and environmental pollution in my view as well. The difficulty is UNGPs don't create those red lines. And I think that's where we need more ambitious norms to create red lines. And we need more ambitious norms to dismantle those irresponsible power structures. Thank you. Can I just um, add to that? Because Surya, I agree with a lot of what you've said. Um, I do want to bring this back, though, to what I think is a crucially, the crucially important sort of gap is that the business and human rights conversation has tended to be much more engaged with issues relating to, for example, labor rights and child labor and those issues than it has been issues involving the environment. So even if in some of the, for example, OHCHR, you know, clarification or the key, key messages that I, I noted earlier, the OHCHR UNEP, they're really good at clarifying what states should do and they touch on what businesses should do, but we're not there yet in terms of clarifying what are the social expectations of business with regard to environmental issues and human rights issues and biodiversity and toxic substances. We have more clarity from some, on some aspects, but it doesn't really filter through because the business and human rights conversation has tended to be focused on has, has the dominant sort of narratives in the business and human rights conversation do not delve deeply into what are very complex issues, right? So tobacco in a sense is easy, even though like the UN Global Compact, for example, I think doesn't let tobacco companies sign up, which is curious because I think it lets a lot of, I could be wrong, but I think it might let arms manufacturers sign up, for example. So you have a lot of thinking about, you know, how do we think about that? Um, but, and, and same with fossil fuels, right? The, co the comment that, you know, while they're hugely problematic in, in, in the climate change context, um, I can tell you that uh, in the province in which I live, if, you know, and, and most of us could say this, if fossil fuels suddenly weren't there, we'd have some really serious issues um, because so much of our, us are dependent upon it. So, so I guess, I guess my comment is just that I think there's a lot of work to do in clarifying what those expectations are of businesses in some of these more complex environmental areas. Um, but I think I think this is really important work, um, even though it doesn't overcome some of the conglomerate and other issues. Um, and, and I agree about the higher expectations and, and broader and different ways of thinking about it. But um, yeah, so we agree that there's a lot of work to do still in clarifying. Absolutely. And maybe that's the final word on this. Um, I'd like to um, ask everybody if you wouldn't mind just turning on your microphones so that our speaker and our discussant can hear your applause. Um, so thank you so much for taking us through this very deep dive into these incredibly difficult, uh, but very, very important issues. Um, it's there's so much more work to be done and so much more thinking to be done on these issues but this introduction this sort of overview of some of the major issues that we're dealing with i think has been absolutely invaluable so i want to thank you very much sarah and surya for your time and your commitment to these issues and and your the work that you're doing um to advance uh, human rights and environmental human rights in these in these areas in particular um, I would also like to take a moment and again, ask you to turn on your microphone so that people can hear you. I would like to just extend a huge, huge thanks to Dina Townsend and Angela Karayuki who have brought this, um, this summer winter school uh, together um, through Dina's inspiration and Dina's and Angela's incredibly hard work in just making this all come to be. Um, and you can expect to hear more from the GNHRE on how this develops um, in the future and watch for the posting of the, um, the sessions that you might have missed or even sessions like this that you're attending, but there's so much important um, content here that you might very well want to look at the videos and we'll post them. So again, Dina and Angela, thank you very much for your inspired work. Um, and your enormous commitment to this.
and I'll leave it to you to um, give the closing words. Thank you, Erin. Thank you to Sarah and Surya and to all the participants today. That was, we, we couldn't have hoped for a kind of better ending to the school, which was really riveting and fascinating and in many ways spanned kind of so many of the issues we've been talking about all week. Um, just to say, it's been... <laughs> Everyone's turned on their... On their yeah, if I can ask you to turn <laughs> off your microphones now, just so we avoid the echo. Thanks. <laughs> Um, to, to just uh, say thank you to everyone who's been involved in the summer winter school. Uh, it's been an extraordinary uh, week to, to, to be part of. It's been an extraordinary project to realize. Um, and we have, we have many, many plans for what to do in coming years and where to take it um, and, and, and the ways we're gonna develop the materials that have come out of this. So as Erin says, keep an eye. Angela, who has been my absolute partner in crime and, and who's become a kind of dear friend through the process of organizing this, couldn't be here, but she asked me to say on behalf of UNEP, we are so excited at UNEP at the success of this first virtual school. And we remain so grateful to all our instructors and our participants for being so interactive. And I need to echo that just the level of engagement and discussion in all of these sessions has been really fantastic. We hope to formalize the school, to convene it in person in the future, and to carry out more environmental education initiatives on topics related to human rights and the environment as part of our global efforts to bring states and other actors closer to universally recognizing and implementing environmental rights. That's a message from Angela and UNEP. Thank you, Erin, and, uh, and have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dina, so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.